Today, I had the real pleasure to sit down with Joel Kibble, award-winning musician, author, and inspirational speaker. As a musician, Joel's been a longtime member of the Grammy-winning multi-platinum vocal group Take Six. But Joel's focus goes much bigger than just music. He's a man on a mission to uplift and inspire. Our conversation happened shortly after the COVID-19 quarantine. We talked about his early musical influences and his first experiments with vocal arrangement on through joining Take Six in 1991. He shared a few of the many amazing experiences he's had traveling the world, working with icons like Marcus Miller, as well as one paradigm-shifting encounter performing at the Oscars and being produced by Quincy Jones. And finally, we got into his journey into becoming a writer and publishing his own book and all the challenges he had to overcome along that road. Honestly, I was just super grateful to be able to sit down, spend an hour with someone as authentic, talented, and experienced as Joel, and I have no doubt you'll feel the same. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Hey, Joel, man, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, you know, you've been a, a member of Air Gig since 2017, and we're just so grateful to have you on the site and all the great work you do with clients. So we really appreciate um, your participation and, and being with us these years. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on this platform. I have learned a lot, gained a lot of experience, and been able to contribute to a lot of clients. And I appreciate you for that. Oh, man. That's great to hear. Well, first, in this crazy time, I just want to check in. And how are you doing? This is obviously the world has changed a lot in the last six weeks. How are you, your family? and We're actually, we're doing good. Uh, the adjustment we have to make now is actually being at home with each other. <laughs> you know, having yeah. spent much of my life on the road, um, wishing that I can be home. Now, actually being home is an awesome thing. But for somebody who spends their life on the road, now, even now, you have to make adjustments. Uh, my wife... Uh, being used to me being home now and, you know, how that shifts the balance and how you have to come to uh, come to a level place now with the new balance is something to adjust to. But I'm thankful because uh, none of us have contracted the virus or had to go through that as yet. What it did do was it cut our tour short by a few dates. And of course, the rest of the dates that were on the books have to either be rescheduled or canceled. And of course, that's a major adjustment. But in short, it has it has forced us into a situation where you have to adjust to the circumstances. Absolutely. And it's interesting because the life of a busy touring musician is the diametric opposite of what you're dealing with now. So it's like the situation completely inverted. I imagine it, right. it is a real period of adjustment, but I, I'm happy to hear that everybody's well and, and, and okay for the time being, because it's it's turbulent time. So I'm really curious about your story from for many reasons, but to start at the beginning, like growing up, when did music first start coming into your life? I know uh, from reading the story about Take Six, your brother was, I think, a founding member of the band. We come actually from a pastoral family. My dad was a pastor. Uh, all my uncles were pastors, grandfather pastors. So there was a bit of singing and music that you were going to deal with every week being in a church setting. Um, and so you have exposure to choirs. You have exposure to quartets. Um Obviously, you know, solo and in lead type of singing. So all of that is is a part of your DNA. But in addition to that, uh, my older brother, Mark, uh, joined the group um, early on uh, when Claude McKnight first started the group. And actually, Claude, Mark and myself all went to the same church. It was my dad's church in Buffalo, New York. And there was a heavy tradition of singing uh, in that that particular congregation. So I always heard music. Uh, I probably heard more traditional uh, vocal music and traditional gospel music. My brother, because uh, it was a, a, a familiar type of, hey, don't sing that, that secular music, you know, 
stay spiritual with the music, sacred music. There was some cheating on our behalf. You know, we would, uh, Mark would, somebody would grab a Earth, Wind and Fire album or Stevie Wonder or sure. my sister used to listen. Uh, I'm really about to date myself. Well, I'm actually about to date my sister. <laughs> she was listening to Sister Sledge. <laughs> so I, this doesn't date me. This dates her. Uh, and so I was able to hear that kind of music. Um, be, I was introduced to that kind of music as we went, you know, as I started growing up. But that was my early exposure to music and harmony and uh, and rhythm and soul and gospel and all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. And, and so when did you actively start singing or was it just always, I guess in church, it was always there. And so everyone was singing. Um, I'm just curious, when did you start to consider yourself a singer? Or, you know, I, I had a late start. Um, I can't say that I actually started singing just before I came out the womb, like a lot of other artists. Right. Sure. <laughs> I always think that's kind of funny. Yeah. But anyway, um, I had a late start in that I really started singing, stepping out and singing probably when I was 13 or 14. And that's probably because I didn't like to be the center of attention. Um, I studied the music that my brother studied and, you know, the stuff he was listening to, I thought he was so cool and I wanted to be like him, but I actually didn't come out from under his shadow until he had left the house and I was in probably high school. I think when I started high school, ninth grade, that's when I began to experiment with um, getting groups together and starting to do simple arrangements and stuff like that that I had seen him do. Um, and, and that's when I started testing out and cutting my teeth on stuff and uh, trying to find my own way. But, you know, in the story of things, I had a late start. Uh, I was a late child. Sure, but it was around you everywhere, and it sort of was seeping in, I'm sure, from... You know, it, it was, you know, the funniest, the, the earliest memory I had was replicating recordings that we were listening to, and we would take the cassette recorder two cassette recorders and I record the first part onto one. I will play that and sing the second part into the next recorder and go back and forth with that until I had, we had the arrangement and the sound that we were looking for. Now it was so dirty and degenerated by the time you get down to four or five parts, but it was just an accomplishment to be able to sing that, three, four, or five part harmony in a situation where you just had two boom boxes right. or two recorders and you were able, that was my earliest memory oh, so of you would, recording and putting this stuff down. It wasn't a four track. You would take one tape recorder oh, yeah. and then yeah, you would no. sing on we top didn't. of the playback of the other tape recorder. That's and then... right. We would have, so we would start and that I learned from Mark. Uh, I would record myself on the first part play that back and sing the second part to the second recorder, take those two parts, sing the third back to the first recorder. And again, all this was on cassette tapes. Right. So there was so much noise by the time you got to the fourth or fifth part right. that you would never play this for anybody, but this was just to prove, ah, I can replicate these harmonies that I'm hearing. <laughs> That's so awesome. And was there some music theory there or was it, were you really hearing the thirds, the fifths, you know, by ear or at that, at that stage? You know what? I had never, I had not get, gotten any uh, formal training and I wish that I had. My parents uh, gave piano lessons to my sister. She's 10 years older than me. My brother, he's seven years older than me, but they didn't show that much of an interest in formal training. So I guess, when I came along, they figured, oh, he's not going to be interested either. We're not going to waste the money <laughs> toward that. But um, everything that I learned was by ear. Everything was by rote, um, which I know there's a, an advantage 
to both, actually. There are different advantages to both. In my adult years, now I realize I got to go back and get theory because I need to be able to articulate what it is that I'm hearing and what it is, that, articulate that to somebody else. Uh, I know how to do it myself by ear. Uh, interestingly enough, with take six, most of the, the way that we learn arrangements is by rote as well. A couple of us can actually, you know, read music, but uh, Mark, myself, a lot of, you know, us in the group pretty much know what we know by ear. And over the years, we've added theory to it. But I'm at the point now where I'm like, you know, as an adult, you never stop learning you always take the opportunity to be able to expand your craft. And one of those areas I need to expand in is theory. Got you, got you. But you were, I mean, even then, you know, sometimes theory works as a tool to help you hear certain intervals or like by learning it, you start like to learn, okay, this is the distance between a first and a third. But in some way you were already hearing those those intervals, you, you, you instinctively heard them. I, and I'll tell you where that instinct came from. It came from listening to everything that Mark was listening to. At that point, he started getting into quartet music. Uh, there was a group called the Breath of Life Quartet uh, that was a gospel quartet. But then he began getting into the high lows. Uh, that was Gene Perling's uh, uh, a group. And... He started getting into Singers Unlimited. And when we started listening to these type of complex harmonies um, and listening to it over and over again, you begin to train your ear on certain intervals um, that I wouldn't be able to tell you what those intervals were, but I knew what they were supposed to sound like. Um, so when I had the chance to do it, I could play it out on the piano but I couldn't tell the vocalist that I was teaching what these intervals were at the time. Right. And the advantage of that was it helped me to move through the arrangements faster. Or if I needed to change something, I could change that immediately. But I wouldn't be able to tell you this is what kind of chord we're singing. Um, that was the disadvantage. But yes, that ear training and ear training for those intervals happened early as I was listening to all of that content. Got you, got you. It's fascinating. I, I do, I totally understand what you're saying. There, there's got to be advantages and then disadvantages. I mean, personally, in a lot of blues and jazz guitar, so I learned from, from studying the licks and solos and then got more into the theory of those sort of things right. you know, afterwards. So, right. But once you kind of get it under, you start hearing those things, you're like, okay, well, then I can unpack this or understand this better or whatever. But in some cases, it's not necessary. In some cases, it is, you know, so it's interesting. So what, so this is coming to about ninth grade. You said you started, were you, you were creating mostly like vocal groups and stuff like that or met, playing around? Were you in any other types of uh, bands with instrumentation or was it mostly vocal groups at that time? You know, I actually was in my school band. So I have to take back a little bit of the answer I said before. I did learn how to play flute. Okay. And so I did read a little bit, but it had, I never made the connection between what I was playing as far as flute and trying to play trumpet and trying out instruments with the knowledge that I had when it came to vocals. I didn't, I hadn't gotten to the place where I connected the two. So that's why it's funny, even when you ask this question, I didn't even think about formal training because the training I got in learning how to play with the high school band never made the connection to the training of how I was arranging for vocals. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense that, that you know, these were sort of still separate areas in, in, in your mind and, and they hadn't, you know, fused in, in that sense. So I, I get it, yeah. But there was a lot of experimentation with music. Um, I probably tried that recording back and forth with some flute parts. It wasn't as exciting as right. doing vocals, but it did teach me some of the basics of ear training and harmony. Um, and now I wish that I would have 
continued it so that I could increase my musical vocabulary. But like I said, it's never too late. Uh, but yes, I did play in the, the, the high school band at one point. And when you were experimenting with the arranging, you said, and sort of putting things together, were you connecting with other uh, kids your age and saying, hey, let's let's put something together here? Or was it more you in the laboratory of your own laboratory experimenting and creating sounds and stuff? I think it was more of me actually getting a group of five guys and um, and working out some of the arrangements that I had in my head or taking a song that was already a quartet song that was recorded and reproducing it. Uh, Take Six does a master class on music and this kind of stuff. And one of our former members, Cedric Dent, who uh, actually is a professor now at MTSU uh, here in Tennessee, he gave us five commandments to vocal arranging. And one of those commandments, it would have been, was that you, to have, to become a good arranger, you got to have what you said, a laboratory. There's got to be a place where you can work out some of the arrangements that have been in your head or that you've been playing on the keyboard. Um, That group was my laboratory. Now I'm able to see how this sounds coming back to me as I teach the parts. And I'm also able to get feedback from the group members. Uh, A lot of times it involved training their ears. um, But when we finally did actually do public performance, it gave a chance to be able to get feedback from people who were listening. And for you to have a laboratory like that, you do need subjects to be able to include on your arrangement, but you also need to be able to get feedback on what works and what's not working. <laughs> Absolutely. So these were friends of yours that you were that you had put together? These were friends of mine, uh, different guys who were in different grades. Some were seniors, some were juniors. Uh, and that's a little bit of how I got earned a little bit of respect while in high school. So it was a good thing. <laughs> that's cool. So you but pulled, yeah, they were friends. Yeah. You pulled them together and said, let's make some music. And you guys were, were working it out. Were you, were you getting together often, like on a weekly thing or was it a uh, just occasionally, occasionally get together? Um, it was fairly often because if you had a group that in high school that actually sounded good yeah. singing, Oh, you got a lot of credibility <laughs> if you yeah. could pull off a song <laughs> and, and sound halfway decent. <laughs> Where were you guys performing? Where- this was at Oakwood Academy in Huntsville, Alabama. So we we would perform at like school functions, you know, like uh, assemblies and stuff like that. And because the high school is on the college campus, Oakwood University, there were some people who would come and teach as far as student teaching from the the college. And when they would hear us, they would make the suggestion, you know what, you might need to sing, you know, at this concert on the college campus, that would be a nice change for them or whatever. And that was huge for us. And that was just like a night at the Apollo. It's like, if you could make it there, you could make it anywhere. And we, we were able a couple of times to cut our teeth in on the college campuses concert. Uh, very scary. I learned a whole lot. But yes, you had plenty of opportunity to be able to demonstrate uh, everything that had been practiced in the laboratory. That's awesome. That I mean, that that feedback is so essential, right? You're in the laboratory, you're you're, you're creating your and then you put it out there and then some stuff and other stuff goes this way. But yeah, it's, it's essential. Some things work, some things don't. Yeah. And the more you're able to receive that constructive criticism, it, it is proportionate to how quickly you grow as a vocal arranger. Did you see yourself as the leader of this group at that time or was it a sort of a collaborative effort? You know, I probably seem, I would probably think of it as a leader 
uh, with the arrangements. Um, and I would, um, you know, collaborate with other arrangers or other people who were good at playing because I wasn't proficient on the keyboard. But if I had somebody who was proficient on the keyboard, I could show them what I was trying to accomplish and we would collaborate that way. Uh, but somebody else might actually lead the group when it comes to, hey, let's let's get on this gig, you know, let's let's sure. let's do this concert or hey, somebody at a church that I'm singing at, they need some music. Hey, let's go sing for this, you know, when we go to church. Yeah. Different people, because we had five different personalities, different people took part in that team effort in getting this group to do, to perform live. I think that's such a great analogy. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, being a musician and being in business, I think a band, I'm sorry to diverge into my own thoughts, but I, I think a band in many ways is a great microcosm for any kind of organization because Absolutely. you have... Um, sort of a vision, someone ha with a vision and a, and a purpose who's like trying to bring something into being. And then everybody is working together for this sort of collective good, you know? It's it's an interesting, uh, I think it's a, it's a really interesting analogy in a lot of ways. And uh, so that's what I was getting at. And I think you described it quite well. So you, you're, you kind of had a, you were hearing arrangements, you wanted to get those arrangements realized and then you all were bringing, you know, different aspects to the to the project, I guess. Is that a fair? That's right. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that now, in addition to recording, I'm also studying disc assessment and disc assessment basically deals with behavioral profiles with different people. They have different behavioral profiles. you got the decisive one who is given to task and makes decisions. They love making decisions. They can take confrontation. You've got another one who is highly interactive. They connect with people. They're the ones who will make the, the personnel connections to get you where you, they're probably, they love being in front of people. That's their gift. You have another one who is the supportive one. They're kind of the glue that keeps the group together. Uh, they're not necessarily out front, but they're able to keep the group together, make decisions, get, you know, make sure they're team players, they keep everybody in line. And then you have the fourth type, which is the technical one. They, they're given to usually arrangements. They're given to all the details. They're, they'll do the research on whatever it is that you're trying to do. If you can get to the point where you have such uh, a team player type of characteristic, you can hand tasks off to those who are proficient in that area. Unfortunately, group dynamics are often limited to your understanding of what it means to be a team player, which is why every group goes through the same type of um, experiences of, of conflict, conflict resolution, you might be an awesome band, but if you don't know how to get along with each other, you're not going to be together for very long. That's another thing that takes six. Six guys have to learn how to harmonize with each other interpersonally mm -hmm. as well as vocally. Sure, We can be an awesome group together, but if we cannot get along, we're not going to be together very long. That's a great point. And... Uh, so many great points in there. I mean, so, so much. And your background touches on two roads as well. Like you, you have a degree in business administration as well, right? So you're yes, sir. So you're very understand the management mindset and business mindset and the creative mindset and where those things overlap and complement. Interesting that you said that. We, I probably joined Take Six in 1991 when Mervyn Warren left the group. You might have seen that in the, the biography. Um, so at, that was a challenge for me because I had just completed my freshman year in college. And of course, my parents were like, absolutely not. You cannot get in this group. You have to finish your education. You got to have something to fall back on. 
this music whole this whole music career situation is gonna crash in your face. You have nothing to fall back on. <laughs> right. And they just gave me the the whole scare tactic. <laughs> sure. Um, and it was actually a music teacher, a music theory teacher, that whose class I was in at the time, who said when my father went to him and said, you know what, he's about to get into this vocal group. They're doing a lot of traveling, but I'm just not sure of how much longevity you can have in this thing. What do you think they should do? Should we let him be in this group? And the music teacher, I never expected this. His name was Dr. Harold Anthony. He said, let him get into this group. There are things that he's going to learn by going into different countries, into different cultures, learning different types of music, learning different languages that I'll never be able to teach him here in this classroom setting. But he's going to get firsthand experience. Let him do this as an opportunity of lifetime. And that's when my dad finally kind of let off the reins and said, okay, we'll do this. So I dropped out of school uh, after my freshman year. And it's interesting because I came back to school uh, probably in 2000 after about nine years of being in the group, traveling, doing concerts and everything. And that gave me the opportunity to say, let me finish my education because my education is important. You can know everything about music that you need to know, but you also need to understand the business environment that you work in. If you're not going to do the, your own accounting, that's fine. But you need to know how to find a good accountant right. who knows what they're doing so that you can administrate that task and responsibility to them. Then they can run and do what they need to do, but you have some knowledge of it. I was able to gain that when I came back to continue my education and finish up my undergrad. Uh, and I did that through distance learning, which had just begun around that time. And I was able to finish up my degree in 2006 while traveling. And interestingly enough, a lot of those life credits, all of that learning, just like that music, music teacher had said, counted for actual hour credits because I was living a lot of what he was talking about in the classroom. When I came back to Oakwood to finish up my undergraduate degree, the chair of the music department at that time said, you have so much information and you have so much experience, you could actually write a handbook for our music students because you've been in recording, you've been in touring, you've been in writing music, you've been in arrangement, you've seen all this stuff, you've met a lot of these luminaries that have been in this industry for years that we can only speak about. You could actually rewrite the handbook for Oakwood University's music department. I didn't realize that, but that's the kind of experience now that I can bring back to the table as I'm finishing up my education. That's awesome. That's awesome. And when you, and that's so true. I mean, God, I mean, you can't even put a value on that type of experience and that type of uh, education, you know, traveling yeah. and playing in a, in, in, in a group like Take Six. So when you decided to go back to school, was there a specific reason? Was there an end? Was there some, was it part of something you always wanted to do? Or were you like, what, what, what motivated you to go back, I guess? You know, you begin to realize what your limitations are. Now, many people will take that route and they'll never come back to education. They might, some people get what they need and some people hit their ceiling. What I begin to learn from these guys, because at the time, most of the guys were older than I, were, I was, you begin to realize, and this is something that I learned from a lot of the luminaries in the industry, I begin to learn from them, keep your hand open when it comes to learning. Do not close your hand. Nobody can put anything into your hand when your hand is closed. If you feel like you know everything, and it's a challenging thing, because to create your own, you have to have some sense of authority, like, I know this. Right. This is where my experience is. I'm an authority in this area. But in that process, if you close your hand 
to where nobody can teach you anything else, immediately you begin limiting yourself and that begins your ceiling experience. One of the, the, the best people to teach that lesson to me was Marcus Miller. We were able to record with Marcus Miller on a particular project and we went on tour with him uh, and his band at a particular time. He is one of the most humble, gracious, but experienced cats in the industry. This guy did production for Miles Davis. Um, if there's anybody, uh, he's Luther Vandross. He, I, I, there are so many people that Marcus Miller has worked with. But the thing that stands out is not so much his incredible talent, but his awesome personality. He will sit down and he will share with you stories that you'd have to buy books to come to understand. While we're recording with him, when he starts talking about how he interacted with Miles Davis and how he created something that Miles Davis was interested in doing, the kind of artist that Miles was running with at the time, that Marcus Miller, who was only 17, when he started out playing with him, had the chance to meet Mingus and had a chance to meet uh, Dizzy Gillespie and had a chance. Now we have the opportunity to learn from this guy who was sitting in front of each one of these legends, learning from the top masters in the industry. He started sharing with me things that I, I that you would pay thousands of dollars to learn in any other setting. But one of those things was keep your hand open. There's something you can learn from every artist that you cross paths with, whether the, you think like think they know a lot or whether you think they don't know much at all. There's always something important you can learn. He's the one that really uh, introduced me to Bill Withers uh, as far as Bill Withers' music because we recorded one of his songs and Bill just passed yeah. uh, just recently. He There was so much knowledge in every person that we cross paths with, that if you just sit there and listen and keep your hand open, you'll gain so much and it'll change everything you know that when you turn around to give back, you have volumes to give back. And that's why we're so indebted to these people. That's lived, I guess you could call that lived knowledge. Like it's, that it's lived, knowledge. lived knowledge. You can't you can't bottle that. It's just oh man, something oh, man. that you get when you're in the presence of somebody uh, who's had you know one of a kind experiences, and, and and it's not even about them imparting a specific lesson. It's sometimes just about being around them, right? I mean, it's sometimes oh. just about watching how they respond to things, or you, you know, know, I'm going to say this. You can keep this on recording, or you can take it off, do whatever. <laughs> We need to do a few of these recordings because I have so much information that I need to share with you that can possibly benefit our listeners. There, there are so many different areas that we just covered that we it, this needs to happen a few more times. Well, in all honesty, uh, I, I feel that feeling of uh, live knowledge from you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I, I wanted to tell you about a particular experience learning from Quincy Jones, but that you will probably need a little bit more time. But he, it's one of the most potent lessons I learned on coming to respect other artists and respecting other producers and having the attitude of, of let me see what I can learn from this particular, uh, th this magnificent legend. Uh, because I didn't come in with an open mind to learn. <laughs> oh, so he, he caught you at a moment when you needed to hear that, I guess is what you're oh, saying. Oh, my goodness. It, when I share the story with you, you know, I know we don't have much more time at this particular situation, but, well, I'll, I'll, I'll share it. He asked us, Yeah. okay, he asked us to be a part of the um, the Oscars. He was producing the Oscars, the music of the Oscars in this particular year. And he was pulling all the connections that he had. And we were blessed to be one of the ones that he said, I want you all to do something on the Oscars. Uh, so he sent a tape of 
what he wanted us to do. In essence, he wanted us to take a specific category with all of the nominees of this category, put in pieces of their music that they were nominated for into the arrangement, um, talk about the stuff that they were nominated for, but make that part of the vocal arrangement <laughs> okay. at the time. And all of that needed to be under two minutes. Wow. And so my brother got the tape. He, We all listened to it. We did what we thought that he was asking for. And to be honest, we were a little bit cocky because at the time, not a whole lot of groups were doing what we were doing at this point in time. The acapella uh, resurgence had not happened yet. And so we were, we were, we were quite a bit cocky. He was actually calling take six to do this thing. And we are going to knock this out the park. Nobody else can claim that they're being called in like this. Right. And so we came into the rehearsal and I remember uh, the run through for the Oscars the night before um, everybody, you know, artists were coming in and they were doing their, their, they're reading the teleprompter. The supermodels were going up and down the runway the, the, you know, they were playing their songs, they were sound checking, and he was in and out from up in the uh, office overseeing everything, but he came down to greet us, and so he was a little bit uh, drunk at the time. <laughs> I could see it in his eyes. And, you know, I came from my religious background, so I'm kind of judging him like, ah, this man, he's toasted right now. Right. You know, he's lost a whole lot of respect as far as I'm concerned. I don't know who Quincy do this Quincy Jones is, but I can see now he needs to learn a little bit of something. And he said, man, I'm glad you all are here. Here's what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Let me hear what you've done with the arrangement. And we sung it through with him. You know, we had waited. We didn't wait until the last minute, but we ran it through so that we could remember it. And then we planned on running a little more later on that night. And he heard the arrangement right there at the front of the stage. And he said, wait a minute, so sing this again? So we sang the, the arrangement again, and he had this look on his face like, I don't know what this is. That's not what I asked you to do on the tape. And he said that, in fact, he said, that's not what I asked you to do. I don't know if you got the tape or not, but there is an upright busted piano at the back of this building in a hallway, you have until the end of this rehearsal to get what I asked you to do, or you guys are gone. Wow. And literally, we, we had to pick our faces up off the floor, go back and find that piano, do the what he was asking us to do, and we literally had to start over again reconstruct the song, rehearse it and get it down to under two minutes. So much so that we could sing it for him before rehearsal was over. We've never been in this position before. Wow. We are super embarrassed. But by the end of, you know, the rehearsal, we went back to him and he said, okay, let me hear what you got. Now, mind you, I'm still trying to take, I'm planning on taking pictures with some of the supermodels who were coming <laughs> off the stage. I had my own agenda set. Sure. But he listened to the, the what we had sung, and it took, I mean, we, we really dug in because we only had a little bit of time to rearrange this whole thing. We sung it for him, and he said, wait a minute, sing that again. We sung it for him again, thinking if we could just, if he could just listen to it, we'll go back to the, the, the hotel and we'll rehearse it, for the rest of the night, so we'll have it straight. He was like, nah, do that again. Wait a minute, I didn't hear exactly what he was singing. He's kind of muffled to himself. Sing that again. Sing that again, because he wasn't smiling. Sing that again, you know, because I don't. Th he didn't sound sure of his part. Sing it again. This is going into the fifth, sixth, seventh time of doing this thing again. Eight, nine, by this time, the people are now, the, run the runway models are done. They're leaving. Everybody's packing up. The musicians are down. They're trying to get information from him. So now, 
And he's like, okay, you, you, apparently I don't have his attention. So sing this song again. Wait, he's not with me. Sing that again. You, you forgot a word. Sing that again. Now we're going into the 10th, 11th, 12th time of singing this arrangement over and over again. By this time, they're shutting down the lights. The janitor is coming through. He's pushing the broom. They're starting to chain up the doors. Everybody, at first, people walking by like, oh, oh, my goodness, Quincy Jones, take six. Oh, this must be a moment. Let me pull out my camera. Yeah. And, of course, you know, we're trying to tease for the camera while still trying to sing. And he's like, wait a minute. He's still taking pictures. No, sing that again. No, wait, he's not focused over here. Sing that again. By this time, we're so embarrassed and we're so broken down, like this guy's not going to let up until we get this thing right. And he had to sing us five more times, six more times. Set. By this time, the lights were off. Everybody had left. The janitor's like, look, I got to lock the, I got to lock it up. We are so embarrassed at this point and so humiliated. And he says something at the end of going through it almost 17, 20 times. He says, now look, tomorrow, this auditorium is going to be filled with about 3,000, 4,000 people. The viewership is going to be in the millions, the millions tomorrow. That will not be the time for you to rehearse and get this right. This is the time for you to get this thing right. I'm talking about glassy eyes. I'm talking about drunk. I'm talking about whatever I thought about him. He burned his respect into me. And that's when I realized this dude has been touring for longer than I've been alive. He would go out on tours not knowing if he's going to sell enough to buy the ticket back to the United States. Wow. And he would plan to live where he was until he earned enough money to come back to the United States. And here I'm thinking, who is this guy? Wh wh he completely took my ego and stomped it. And by the time we walked out the door, some of us, some of us were close to tears. <laughs> yeah, imagine. Some of us were angry, but nobody had anything to say. We rehearsed that thing so hard that night, the next morning, going over and over and getting every little thing perfect, timing ourselves, getting that thing together, that by the time we did the performance the next day, that was one of our most flawless performances. Wow. Now watch this. He's responsible not just for the music, but everything else that was going on, the sound man, whatever. The next day, Cicely Tyson got up to say something, introduce something. And for five seconds, her mic was not on. And for little situations like that, they never asked him to come back, not to my knowledge, to produce the, the Oscars. But our part was nail air tight because he had grilled the fool out of us and commanded that respect. And I came to understand why Quincy Jones is who he was. And that influenced how we approached any other performance we did. And we learned it from somebody who did this thing on the road for his life long before I was ever born. Talk about lived experience. Talk about, I, I mean, what I heard in that story was, I don't know, the word commitment came to my mind. I don't know if that's uh, something, yeah. but that level of commitment that you're talking about, that is a lived experience. Like yeah. you can yell at someone and, and tell them they got to be more committed. They got to be more focused, more. But if you're not living it from that place and he was living it from that place and, sh and that was yeah. coming through, right? Like that's. Oh man, and you got to learn not to judge people by the, the cover of that book. Yeah. That dude is so full of experience that anytime he speaks, you need to be there with recorder or notepad or something because what he's giving to you, that information costs other people thousands of dollars to learn. And here he's giving it to you for free. Yeah. And so when I approach an arrangement, a vocal arrangement for somebody on air gig, you're getting the benefit 
of having learned this approach and this level of commitment from Quincy Jones in how I give you this vocal arrangement. Now, you won't see that on your end. You won't see how long it took me to have to get this to where it needs to be so that when you pay me for a service, you're getting the quality that Quincy Jones taught me to let that be my benchmark. That's where it translates to the client that I work for. Oh, man. I mean, you know, this is such an opportunity for clients. Uh, you know, any listening at this time, I mean, you know, Joel, well, not, not only because he's homebound at the moment, but, you know, to work with someone of this skill and caliber, you know, you got to you gotta get it while it's there. <laughs> so you got <laughs> to jump on it. So that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That is amazing. So you've written a book. Is that right? Sir, that's right. And, that's right. And tell us a little bit about that book or if you wish to and where it came from and, and, and how that plays into your life. Uh, this is a book called Out of the Desert Flow Rivers. It actually started, it's a 35-day devotional. Um, while I was doing what I was doing with Take Six, once we got a website, they thought, you know what, this needs to have kind of an inspirational corner. Why don't you do kind of an inspirational blog? Um, you know, there were some other people blogging for it. Alvin Chia, he's an awesome uh, blogger and writer. And he said, why don't you handle the inspirational side of it? And because within the group, uh, we will have, every time we get out to have a performance, we have a moment of devotion and a moment of inspiration before we go out on stage to make sure all of us are on the same page. I would take that and put that into a blog to inspire a lot of our followers. After a while, um, after a couple of years, the suggestion was made, why don't you take those blogs that you've done and compile them into a devotional? Now, you have to understand there's not been another author in my family, in my immediate family, and actually in my extended family. So I was going to be that first author. But to do that, I had to gain new ground. I had to begin to learn about how to become an author, how to put together a book, how to. And so this is not a lane that I've been in before. But because going back to uh, adult continuing education had taught me as a an adult learner, you never stop learning. Now, this is the difference between what's characteristic of my generation and the generation before. To the generation before, when you're done with school, you're done with school. You're not coming back. I've outgrown that situation. But technology has changed so drastically and it changes so quickly. Think about how quickly this has changed. In the last couple of weeks, it has totally transformed how you do business online because of a world epidemic that has changed not just the music industry, it's changed every business. And if every business has not learned how to pivot and adjust and serve their people in an absolutely new way, you will either adjust or you become extinct immediately. Truth. <laughs> Which I know is the challenge that you've gone through uh, leading as far as this platform is concerned, that's where I learned that, that, that you never stop learning. You have to take technology, learn it, continue to learn and learn to become efficient so that you have something to contribute so that you stay relevant. And that's where I learned that. Um, so that, um, when it came to, uh, what I can contribute now, it's not just music. It's also, you know what, I've learned enough that I can take these blogs and create a book. Well, I didn't know that I was an author. I had never thought of myself that way. But when I was challenged to do so, I was able to become, okay, let's put this together. Let me learn the process of putting together a book. Now watch, I prob that book was probably written years ago. The book was finished years ago. But it took years for me to learn how to get past my fears. 
it tur- took years to learn how to get past mental obstacles. Seeing myself as an author, putting myself in that position and becoming what I dreamt about becoming. But now Take Six has created a platform with where which I can, I have credibility as I now speak to you about what I'm writing about. Whereas I've been singing about this for years, but now writing it in this format, now I realize, oh, I have some credibility already. Let me finish this book. And so only a, a couple of years ago did I finally put out the ebook version. Now, when they first needed to put it out, they came with some with an astronomical amount. You got to have this much to get your book printed, to do all this kind of stuff. And I was scared out my mind, didn't come back, didn't think about it for another couple of years. Good thing about it was technology had changed so that now you have print on demand, you have ebooks. And just like the music industry went through this huge transformation, um, the book industry also, the publishing into it, uh, the book publishing industry went through their transformation. And now you have ebooks, you got you download books, you and so a lot of the costs that had been an obstacle before are now not existent like they used to be. Here's your opportunity. Jump into your opportunity which is a word about this situation. You have a, a, an adverse situation that you have to deal with, that everybody has to adjust to. But you have to remember, there are opportunities in every adversity that you have to deal with. Every challenge conceals some kind of opportunity that if you have the eyes to look for it, you will learn to see, oh, let me look past this pandemic let me look past what you have to do to change and realize here's an opportunity to be able to serve my clientele all the more efficiently. Let me learn how to adjust to that. If you can do that and have that mindset of constantly learning, you will always be able to keep your contribution fresh and stay on the top edge of what's being offered out there. Does that make sense? So, the, okay, so just to answer your question, it was an ebook. Eventually, it became a print book the next year, print on demand. And after that, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I released my audio book. Awesome. Um, and the way the audio book came about was I went to school, I went to, I took a class to learn voiceovers. After taking that class for a whole year, I could not get one single job, not one. No matter how I seem to position myself, right. didn't get one thing. But when I realized that I needed an audio book along with uh, the print book and the ebook, I realized I already have what I need. I know how to set my levels. I know how to come back to every, at the beginning of every day, make sure everything, I know how to read. I know how to make it interesting. I already have what I need. And so while I couldn't get a job, I actually sat here and read my book and created my own audio book. Now the audio book is finished. Now I'm trying to figure out when should I release it or whatever. I wasn't even thinking about releasing it during this pandemic. But somebody said, oh, you need to go buy his book. And I thought to myself, these people now have an opportunity because everybody's on the internet. Everybody's at home. What better time to encourage them with inspirational thoughts where they have to, they need to be encouraged. They don't have anywhere else to go. Now's the time to release my audio book. And so I just released it a couple of weeks ago uh, since you asked, but that came as a result of when you try to apply yourself to be the best that you're able to be, you're going to find that doors are going to open on the way that you, that had not opened before you committed to moving forward and to being the best at what you are. And when you have the eyes to take advantage of those new opportunities, you'll find that when you're done and you look back, oh, wow, I planted this seed. This is what it's yielding. I planted this seed as a result. That's what it's yielding. Now you have five more offerings where you only started off with one. So true. And so much good stuff in there. I mean, 
you know, at, at, at a time like this, you know, when you turn, the problem hits us all, you know, over the head, right? And we can get stuck in that, but it's a metaphor. This is like a, a this time is a metaphor for, for life, you know, even in smaller challenges, any challenge that arises, if we can turn slowly from the, from the challenge to the opportunity, that's such a powerful shift, you know? And yes, like you say, you'll fail at this. You'll go in one direction. You'll hit a wall, but yes. you've learned something. You don't even realize what you've learned in going in that direction. Yeah. And suddenly you'll, you'll take off in this direction and you might yeah. hit another wall. And as long as you keep moving, I think Winston Churchill said uh, success is being able to tolerate failure after failure with a good nah. attitude or something like that. Nice. You know, but then suddenly you're suddenly after your persistence and your 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 desire to stay with it and to keep moving in the right direction things emerge like you said the seeds start to grow so i think it's so important i think also like what you're talking about is you're a musician and, and a lot of musicians myself included at a certain time had a certain idea about like well that's what i that's all i am you know that's all i want to be and when we lose that and just follow our creativity in whatever direction, yeah. it's, it's gonna lead us in, in ways that will complement, that will bring all of our, our skills and all of our abilities to the table. That's right, that's right. You said something about failure. When they find the vaccine, that vaccine is a culmination of failed attempts there's probably a number associated with that particular vaccine because each one of these vaccines had been tried and something failed about it. But they reevaluated, they came back and tried something else. That may have failed. They come back, they look at it, they reevaluate, they try and come back until you find a vaccine that actually hits the target and now it's able to serve the masses. But every vaccine Every new invention is a culmination of, of processes, systems of failures that you have learned from and you've come back. Now, here's something that I'll share about myself. I didn't grow up in a culture that valued failure. When I failed at something, I was a miserable wreck. It's something you should never try again. It's something that you, oh, you should have known how to do it. You should have known how to hit the ball out the park the first time you swung the bat. I didn't have a mindset that allowed me to fail, but that's the only way that you actually learn. Nobody comes off the block, picks up a bat, and suddenly swings for the first time and hits it out the park. I, I don't know of anybody who well, does that. Well, there are, you know, maybe uh, the one thing I'll say is sometimes people have some natural talents or ability and they get out the chute really quick with something, but then encounter obstacles after that. So that potential has got to be developed right? so that you reach the potential and it doesn't remain just potential. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Wise words for a time that, that needs them desperately right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us, yeah. tell us on a daily basis, how do you, what's, what's, you have a morning routine or do you, how do you keep yourself focused? How do you, how do you, any rituals you do that uh, keep you on check and, and, and moving forward productively and stuff? Oh yeah. First thing I have to do is connect myself spiritually. Um, I am, you know, my particular faith is I'm a Christian. I got to connect with God. Uh, he is the resource from which I now procreate. He is a creator. I procreate when it comes to my music, when it comes to the book, when it comes to speaking people, inspiring people. I'm able to create because he's given me an element of creativity that I can completely blow out. Got to connect with him first. But then I need to serve my body. One of the challenges is, and I, I have done tr challenges, like I started training for a triathlon earlier. That was the hardest thing my physical body has ever been subjected to. But I needed to accomplish something because what you fill your body with is universal. If I fill my body with discipline and training, 
it is it's going to bleed over into how I do business. If I allow myself to receive that challenge to become consistent, to knock down the limitations, to put myself in the company of people who do this all the time and they're successful, come with that open hand, learn from them, I will begin to uh, become what it is that I, I look up to. That's why it's important the company of people that you surround yourself with. If I'm trying to become a millionaire, I need to hear how millionaires think. I need to know how they invest. What do they invest in? How do they use their money? When I do that and I learn from them, then I begin to treat my money and my resources the same way. Well, whatever you learn in one area of your life can be applied in another area of your life. So that means I got to get out and I got to exercise. I've got to keep my body in shape because my mind can breathe and be creative if my body is in good health. Sure. Now, I can still be creative if I never exercise, but eventually your body and its position is going to end up dragging on your creativity. Because if I come down with diabetes or I come down with a heart situation, well, now um, I can't really be in the studio like I want to because I didn't treat my body right. And if I learn how to treat my finances correctly, then I begin to make right investments, not just uh, monetary investments, but business investments, because I've learned the principle of investing. I got to do that every day. I've got to take my talent and use it every day. Here's plenty of opportunity for me to get on this guitar and learn how to play this guitar that I've been playing on stage and take my guitar playing and my writing to the next level. I have plenty of, because the one thing that I have now is time. I have a little more undisturbed time because I'm sitting in the house the whole time. Correct. I can come down in the studio and produce quite a few new things, but it's only going to be my choice. I can waste that time if I want to. And when COVID-19 is done, I can come out just as limited as I went into it. Or I can learn to see opportunity, see I've got some time to work on my singing. I got some time to work on my playing, on my songwriting. And now I have three more things I can offer to my clients. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I do. Time to spend with my family. Because if my family is taken care of, they will then support me as I do my work. Because everything supports everything else. How, the, the, the income that I bring in supports my family. As they're taken care of, they support what I do down here. Got to take time with my family. Uh, so to answer your question, exercise. I got to connect spiritually with my maker. I got to use creativity, uh, creatively what's in my hand and expand upon that. And you'll come out again realizing I have much more to offer than when I went into this situation. Very nice. Very nice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, if, sir. Any, if anyone were say a young Joel setting out now, you know, on a path of yes. this music industry or in a path of pursuing their own creativity or, or, mm -hmm. you know, any, any such road, are there any few takeaways you'd want to leave them with from your journey that we haven't covered on or. There are so many takeaways. We would need another yeah. call for it. We should do one for but sure. What I, yeah, uh, absolutely. But I'll leave a couple. You know, we can only digest so much in one sitting. Sure. Um, in terms of what we just talked about, allow yourself to fail. Allow yourself the privilege of failing. Because you're not going to learn another way more effectively than if you allow yourself to write a bad song. Then figure out, listen to feedback. And figure out what's bad about this song. What could I do better about this song to communicate the idea? Is it the idea itself? Is it the vehicle? Is it the arrangement? What can I do to create a better song? 
open yourself up to learning, to allowing people to deconstruct what you do and then to show you here's the wanting area right here. Let's now rebuild this and then put it all back together and let's see what we have. One thing that uh, Cedric Dent often said was to become a better arranger, um, take your favorite arrangement and deconstruct that arrangement and put it down to its basic elements and study each one of the elements. Then rebuild that arrangement again, transcribe the arrangement, see about the parts you love and how they fit in, how they match up to the lyrics, how that all puts to get, is put together with somebody who communicates that song and then reconstruct that whole situation. Mark was good about this. If he saw radio, Mark was good about taking that entire radio apart, breaking it all the way down and then having to put every piece back into place and reconstructing it. It gives your mind an opportunity to see this is why this radio is what it is. These are the elements that made it what it was. Now Mark took everything he learned about deconstructing mechanics and he did it to his song. He listened to Quincy Jones. He listened to the big band arrangements. He would break everything down about each one of these arrangements and then he would reconstruct it in both that same song and now the principles on another song. And he would find that everything that he could ingest by listening, he was able to reproduce and then put his mark on it. And he's become such a great arranger, I still look up to him as, as an adult that still looks up to his older brother. But I learned that by watching him fail, come back to that fail, failure, learn from that failure, and then come back with something else that makes that second attempt much better. Allow yourself to fail so you can learn. And I guarantee you, when you stay with it, you're going to hit that target at some point. There's no way you can't hit the target when you're constantly learning from every situation that you do. And so, I, there's a, a friend that I have that's in business, and he said that his father always allowed him to fail. There was nothing that was humiliating about failure. It was simply the process by which you learn to do whatever you got into this thing to do. There's no humiliation. There's no stigma. Somehow I grew up with a stigma. And now as an adult, let go of the stigma. You're going to miss the mark. Figure out how to hone your skill so that you are now aimed at the mark, shoot straight, and you're going to hit the mark. So powerful, so powerful. Yeah, it's it's. I think that's great advice for for starting musicians and creatives who you know you you set your goal. You're always gonna fall. You know you have your the people that inspired you. You're, you're always gonna fall short of that as you're walking in that direction. But if you keep yeah. walking, you're gonna learn how to be you in some sense and how to achieve the things that you you need to achieve. So i think that's amazing man i think uh this has been great for me this talk i mean you know oh, i'm gonna awesome. i'm gonna listen to it a bunch of times i know i know <laughs> i imagine other people will too and i definitely want to do more i definitely want to do more. Good. let's do it let we have plenty of time all right let's man. get it done let's do it again let's do it again and for yeah. everyone check out joel kibble on air gigs for sure he's you know this is a great opportunity to get some work done with a with an a-list uh, singer here so so don't pass on this opportunity and joel Yay. thank you man for the time thank you sir all, all right. right talk to you yep